Hello there. In this video, I want to talk about how to solve a system of linear, coupled, homogeneous differential equations. Uh, this video is extremely important because in the next video, I'm going to plan on exploring a little bit about coupled oscillators. Um, and this is a fundamental technique that's kind of uh, necessary in order to explore that idea. What I really want to get across is how we can exploit linear algebra to kind of break this down into a very uh, logical, uh, clear-cut process in order to solve these kinds of differential equations. So let's go ahead and get started here. So we have these differential equations, and just as a reminder, in case we're not used to this notation, when I have a dot, right? So I have x1 dot, this refers to taking the time derivative of x1, okay? So we have these two first order differential equations here, right? And we have x1 and x2 mixed through these differential equations, and so they're coupled. And the first thing that we can do, because these are linear differential equations, we can go through and we can write them out in a really nice form. And I'm gonna write it like this. x dot is equal to the matrix 1, 1, 4, 1, x, where x is defined to be the n-tuple, x1, as a function of time, and x2, as a function of time. So in other words, this n-tuple x is going to contain our solutions x1 of t and x2 of t, right? And so we start just by verifying that, you know, this rewrite makes sense. If I go and I plug this little n-tuple in for x, yeah, I did, I, you know, I multiply this matrix out, I'm going to go and get this right-hand side here, and of course, taking the derivative, you know, we just apply the derivative uh, through this little column here, and of course, we're going to get the left-hand side, right? So this is a really convenient notation, but it's also not just a convenient notation, it's going to highlight some really fundamental ideas here. So I'm also going to recognize that we could even reduce this down further if we just consider this uh, matrix here and we package it as some matrix I'm going to call A, then we're left with the following form, right? We recognize that we have this form here, x dot is equal to the matrix A times x, okay? Now things are going to get very interesting, okay? Because up until this point, I've been very careful while talking. I've just referred to this x here. I've just referred to it as an n-tuple, which is what it is. It's an n-tuple of functions here. But now I'm going to upgrade my language, okay? And I'm going to upgrade my language using the following fact. The set of solutions x to x to the n, where n is the nth derivative of x, is equal to ax. This set of solutions forms a linear vector space. This is a big claim, but it's really important that we just lock this down. If you wanted to verify this fact, you would have to go through the list of postulates for what a vector space must follow. You could propose two arbitrary solutions, x1, x2, and then just observe, you know, some of those key postulates like closure and like the existence of a, a, a zero vector etc. And you could go through that list of postulates and then verify that, yeah, in fact, the set of solutions to this, uh, you know, system of differential equations here forms a vector space. So if my solutions to this system here form a linear vector space, wait, I can define a basis for a vector space, can't I? Right? In other words, I can define some basis vectors and then take a linear combination of those basis vectors in order to build up any vector x in my vector space. You see why that's so powerful to come up with this conclusion of a linear vector space? Because now my goals changed. I just took a big shift. I went from thinking about this system of differential equations as a Diffie Q's problem to now I'm thinking this is a linear algebra problem and I'm trying to find a basis. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to find the basis vectors for our linear vector space formed by our solutions x here? Well, here's an idea. One thing that we can definitely find if you give me, you know, some matrix A, right? 
is I can find the eigenvectors for that matrix. And under the right conditions, and the easiest condition is if we have distinct eigenvalues, right? Then the eigenvectors of that matrix will be linearly, in, uh, linearly independent. And therefore, we can form a basis with, with these eigenvectors. So in other words, this is a great motivation to turn this into an eigenvector problem. All right, so with this motivation in mind, I went ahead and wrote out a little roadmap here for us to follow. And once we follow first the blue, followed by the red, we're going to have our solutions laid out in front of us for this problem. We start with the eigenvector problem that we just talked about. And then we're going to find that we need just a little bit more information to bring it all together. And so we're going to f uh, fully uh, connect it back to the differential, you know, nature of the problem itself. And then once we've gone through that, we'll be done with the problem. So let's go ahead and start with the blue path. So we have our matrix 1, 1, 4, 1 times x. And this is going to be equal to some eigenvalue lambda times x. And we first want to find our eigenvalues, as always, by the characteristic equation, determinant of a minus lambda i is going to be equal to zero. So we go through one minus lambda, one, four, one minus lambda, take the determinant, set that equal to zero. And we're going to have one minus lambda squared minus four is equal to zero. We go through, distribute this out. We're going to get one plus lambda squared minus two lambda minus four is equal to zero. We just group our terms together, right? Lambda squared minus two lambda minus three equals zero. And of course, we're going to immediately see here we have lambda minus three times lambda plus one is equal to zero. And of course we find that lambda is equal to minus one and three. We have our eigenvalues. And so now to find our eigenvectors, again, we're just returning back to ax equals lambda x. And we can rewrite this as a minus lambda i times x is equal to zero. And so we'll go ahead and start with uh, lambda equals minus one. We'll find the eigenvector associated with that. So we have lambda equals minus one. And so we just plug in. So we have one minus minus one, one, four, and one minus minus one times x, which is going to have some component x one of t and x2 of t, right? Again, these are functions that we're ultimately looking for in here. And this is equal to zero. Awesome. And so we're going to be left with two, one, four, two, x1, x2 equal to zero. And when we multiply this out, let's go ahead and just look through the top multiplication. The bottom is going to give me the exact same thing right? We just get 2 times x1 plus x2 is equal to 0. And so we find that 2x1 is equal to minus x2. And so what I'm going to go ahead and do from here is if I call x1 gamma as a function of time, right? Then our eigenvector x associated with lambda is equal to minus one is going to look like gamma of t and then of course minus two times gamma of t okay and next we're going to uh, find the eigenvector associated with lambda is equal to three 
And for this, I'm not going to go through and write it all out. I'm just going to jump straight to the result. The process is exactly the same. And we're going to find that the eigenvector associated with lambda is equal to 3 is equal to 1, 2 times some function of t. I'm going to distinguish it from this gamma, okay? And I'm just going to call it delta of t instead. All right, just to summarize, uh, by following the blue route here, I've gone in, I found two unique eigenvectors here. I found the relations of these components. We still have these unknown functions, gamma and delta of t. Once we have those, we're set. We have our basis vectors, and from there we can build up any solution x with some linear combination of these eigenvectors, and we're golden. So let's go ahead and follow the, the red route over here now. Okay, so I'm going to start with the... Uh, eigenvalue lambda equals minus 1. So we plug that in. So we have minus 1 times our eigenvector, which is just here. Let's plug that bad boy in. 1 minus 2 gamma of t. Great. And this is going to be equal to, we're going to take the time derivative of that. Okay, so I'm just going to plug this in here. And I'll literally just plug it in. I'll write this out very kind of long-windedly, but just so we're totally clear. I'm just plugging my eigenvector in, and we're taking the derivative of that with respect to time. And of course, this vector here is just a constant, right? This is just going to be equal to 1 minus 2 d gamma dt, right? And isn't this so nice? Look, look how beautiful this is, right? These both have this same little constant vector on the same side. Let's just ignore it. So we have minus gamma of t is equal to d gamma dt. We go and we pick that out. And then from there, I mean, this is just a really, really nice and easy differential equation. Let's go ahead and separate this out. I'll have dt is equal to minus d gamma over gamma integrate both sides, right? We're doing this kind of long-handedly. Minus ln of gamma is equal to t plus some arbitrary constant c, you know, and if we want to be overly precise, absolute value there, but it's okay. And of course, isolating for gamma, we're going to end up getting gamma is equal to some constant c e to the minus t. And so now we're just going to take this and we're going to plug it back in over here. Okay, awesome. Let's go ahead and do the same thing for lambda is equal to 3. This is going to be a lot faster. I'm going to go through this much quicker. We're going to have 3 times delta is equal to d delta dt. We're going to go through and we're going to solve it. And then we're going to find that delta is equal to, uh, I'll call this arbitrary constant d, e to the 3t. And now all that we have to do is we have to plug things back in for delta. Great. And now to put this all together, because we had distinct eigenvalues, these eigenvectors here form a basis for my space of solutions. And so now, knowing that this forms a basis, I can write any arbitrary solution x as equal to some linear combination. And these already have arbitrary constants attached to them, so I'm just going to keep using those arbitrary constants uh, as constants of some linear combination, right? But I can write out any solution as some linear combination of these basis vectors. Awesome. And just to totally break this down again, right, reminding ourselves that x here, this is some x1 of t, and this is some x2 of t, then there we go. We just read out the rows, and we're going to be left with the following solution. We have x1 of t is equal to ce to the minus t plus de to the 3t, and we have x2 of t is equal to uh, minus 2c e to the minus t plus 2d e to the 3t. And there's our answer. 
See, we didn't have to use any onsots or anything like that, we were just guided by some linear algebra, and we followed a fully logical process in order to get our solution, uh, or our solutions to this uh, system of differential equations. Uh, I hope you found this video helpful. I'm going to use the, the math that I talked about in this video in uh, a future video where I look at uh, coupled oscillators. Um, but yeah, thank you so, so much for watching.